The number 666 is notorious. It's found throughout horror movies, dark novels, comic books, and so much more. You name it. There is actually a disconnect, however, between what this number means and portrays in these horror movies and what it actually means to an occultist. In other words, this number does have significance in occult work and esotericism, but that meaning is different. So let's talk about it. This presentation is all about the actual meaning, symbolism, and significance of 666 in occultism. If this is a new subject for you, then you're going to be quite surprised. The movies lied to you. So let's get into it. This is a preview of Things to Come and how I decided to approach this presentation. I did intentionally narrow my discussion to Western esotericism and ceremonial magic with a particular focus around Aleister Crowley. This is an area of interest for me, so my presentation organically drifted in this direction. I am starting with Pythagoreanism and Neoplatonism to give you an idea of the connection between magic and math. Six and 666 are numbers with magical significance, so you need to know a little bit about what that means. Then I get into grimoires, planetary numbers, Kabbalah, and magic squares. I know getting into magic squares is a little technical and I will lose some people, but for the right people, I think this is going to be super interesting and valuable for you. This is real occultism and not a flyover gleam from Wikipedia article stuff. Of course, I hope this sparks your interest and you actually go read the original grimoires, but this video is a taste and a start. Also, a lot of people have time or access to a quick YouTube video, but not necessarily these grimoires. I see you and you are so valid. We do what we can with what we have. You are not less of an occultist or magician for having less. As always, these videos are my gift to you and I hope you enjoy it. In my outline, once I have those points established, I go on to talk about the Bible. Then our favorite magician, Aleister Crowley, his childhood identification with the beast, and what all of this means to modern occultism today. Thanks to Pythagoreanism and Neoplatonism, math has long been associated with mysticism and magic. Pythagoras was a Greek philosopher and mathematician who viewed numbers as sacred. He was born around 570 BC. He was credited with many mathematical and scientific discoveries, including the famous Pythagorean theorem. He viewed numbers as divine representations. Pythagoras and his teachings focused on the significance of numerology. He believed that numbers themselves explain the true nature of the universe. Pythagoreanism is based upon the figure of Pythagoras. The main belief of Pythagoreanism was that the universe and all things within it were made by numbers and thus everything could be counted. Pythagoras believed that through numbers, the universe and all of its secrets could be revealed and understood. Neoplatonism is a version of Platonic philosophy that emerged in the third century AD. Neo-Pythagoreanism was influenced by Middle Platonism and in turn influenced Neoplatonism. It gets a little complicated, but essentially there was a sharing of ideas. Found within Neoplatonism is the idea of divine emanations. That is the idea that the universe emanates from God in a divine unfolding. If you are familiar with Kabbalah, then this should sound familiar to you. The idea of emanations from Neoplatonism influenced medieval Jewish philosophy, Kabbalah, and this idea of Sephirotic emanations of the Tree of Life. Here's a quote from Neoplatonism and Jewish Thought by Len E. Goodman. Many Jewish philosophers were troubled by the necessitarian aspects of Neoplatonism. To remove this difficulty, some introduced the divine will with N the emanationist scheme, although it is not always clear how a given philosopher understood this will. Isaac Israel was the first medieval Jewish Neoplatonist. In characteristic Neoplatonist fashion, Israeli holds that God is transcendent, not comprehensible by the human mind. So now that we have talked a little bit about history and the association of numbers with mysticism, let's get a little deeper into this idea of divine emanations. This is the key piece which connects the planets to the tree of life. 
The tree of life, which is on your screen, can be thought of as the map of the mind of God, the map of creation, and the way of return. It is within this mapping that numbers are assigned to the sephirotes, which are associated with planets. In other words, planets have numbers. The tree of life symbolizes the ten sephirot or divine emanations. In Kabbalistic texts, the upper three sephirot are considered transcendent and belong to what the Gnostics understood as the realm of the unknown and ineffable godhood. To quote the astrological world of Jung's Liber Novus by Liz Green, the central light of the tree is related to the sephira called Tiferet, translated as glory or beauty, who unites the upper realms with the lower and is symbolized by the light of the sun. So this sephirot, Tiferet, is number six and is associated with the sun. Okay, so now we know that the planets have numbers associated with them in this mapping of the mind of God or the tree of life. What does that mean and what can we do with that? And who else is talking about magic and numbers in the occult? Actually, a lot of the classic grimoires talk about planetary numbers and their usage. Let's go through some of them as examples. First, let's turn to the classic grimoire, Three Books of Occult Philosophy by the legend himself, Agrippa. His Three Books of Occult Philosophy came out in 1533, and it is one of the most important texts in Western magic. In his second book on the celestial world in these three books, he talks about using these planetary numbers to create magic squares. This is what he says magic squares are. Magicians refer to certain tables of numbers assigned to the seven planets, which are called the sacred tablets of the planets. They signify many and very great virtues of the heavens, inasmuch as they represent the divine reasoning of the celestial numbers, impressed upon the celestials by the divine mind through the reason of the world soul and the sweetest harmony of those celestial rays according to proportion of effigies, co-signifying the super-mundane intelligences which can be expressed in no other way than by the marks of numbers and characters. Here are some pages right out of the book showing you these magic squares. A magician could use these magic squares for a lot of purposes. Just as an example, perhaps if you wanted more success or prosperity in your life or you have a special project you're working on, you might make a Jupiter talisman to attract those planetary virtues. That Jupiter talisman could have magical square associated with it and directly on the talisman itself, or perhaps that magical square could be present during the ritual in which you create the talisman. So, we just talked about Jupiter. What about the sun? Yes, there are those magic squares for the sun that can be used magically to attract those virtues of the sun. This is what Agrippa says about it. The fourth table is for the sun and consists of a square of six and contains 36 numbers, which has six in any side and diameter producing 111. And the entire sum is 666. Presiding over them are divine names with an intelligence for and a daemon for evil. And from them are elicited characters and spirits of the sun. When the sun is fortunate, if carved in gold plate, it makes the wearer famous, amiable, pleasing, powerful in all works, makes men equal with kings and princes, elevates them to the highest peaks of fortune, and makes one acquire whatever they desire. Here is a really cool historic example of a magic square found in the book Magus, The Art of Magic from Faustus to Agrippa. It has to do with this magic square depicted in this art titled Melancholia I by Albrecht Drewer. Here's the quote. In this engraving, a magic square, the series of numbers from 1 to 16, arranged in the proper order in a square with 16 cells, invokes the power of Jupiter, a beneficent planet. 
against the devastating influence of Saturn. Magic squares like this originated in the Arabic world. Often they had their top row of cells filled with letters of divine names or with the first letter of a verse from the Quran, and the lower rows were permutations on them. Since Arabic letters, like Hebrew, have numerical values, each magic square automatically forms a mathematical figure, and it was in this form that they became popular in the West. This book is Meditation and Kabbalah by Arya Kaplan. It's a great book, and I recommend this book in general. But we are particularly interested here in the fact that this book explores the topic of magic squares, which has been a part of Kabbalah since the 16th century. Some of you may find this surprising, which is why I recommend this book. The squares 3 through 9 are the planets. 10 through 20 are the sephirot. There were magic squares for the Sephirot on the Tree of Life. Here's the page in the book showing those magic squares. If this interests you, then be sure to grab a copy of this book. As always, all the books I mention in this video are listed in the description below. This book I am showing you is the book of the sacred magic of Abramel and the Mage. This is a classic grimoire. It was probably written around the 1700s. Throughout this book, there are magic squares. The magic squares in this book, however, are letters. This is an example illustrating the diversity of magic squares, that they can be written in letters too. But it also illustrates how magic squares are all throughout the classic grimoires. Let's look at this book. Grimoires, A History of Magic Books by Owen Davies. It came out in 2010 and is a nice overview and history of some of these grimoires. Here's a quote from the book that makes the connection between ancient history and all of those medieval grimoires. Magic squares consisting of a grid of numbers of astrological, metaphysical, or mystical significance are thought to have spread westwards from China in the late first millennium thanks to Persian and Arab traders. The magic squares also became an integral element in Indian magic, perhaps around the same time as papermaking was introduced there from China in the 8th century. Here is an example from a 12th century Arabic grimoire. This lovely page is found in Art of the Grimoire, an illustrated history of magic books and spells by Owen Davies. You're looking at a grimoire called The Son of Knowledge, and it is written by Ahmed bin Albuni. As you can see, here is another example of magic squares. Magic squares are woven all throughout different cultures and traditions over time. So let's back up. What have I been sharing with you so far? Well, quite simply, across a bunch of different cultures throughout history, numbers have magical properties, and with that knowledge, you can make these things called magic squares. The specific details of what that means or how to make a magic square depends on the culture, religion, and tradition. I threw out a bunch of different examples and sources, but narrowing it down to 666, we learn in the occult context that 6 is a solar number and 666 comes from a magic square for the sun. The sun's properties, according to Agrippa, are being famous, amiable, pleasing, and powerful. So if you want to attract those positive occult virtues of the sun, 666 would be your number. So let's keep going. We have a few more things to cover. Before we talk about Aleister Crowley and his deal with 666, let's talk about the Bible and what is going on there. This book gives us Revelation 13:18, where the number of the beast is given as 666. Not only does it give us the number 666, but we see that Greek letters also have numerical values, which opens up the interpretations via isopsophy. Isopsophy is the practice of adding up the number values of the letters in a word to form a single number. The total number is then used as a metaphorical bridge to other words evaluating the equal number. Isopsophy is related to gematria. Gematria is the same practice using the Hebrew alphabet. This book is Sword of Song by Aleister Crowley. 
This collection of poetry and essays was not only Aleister Crowley's first talismanic book, but also he identifies himself with the beast 666. As you can see on the cover, there is a magical square of sixes. The book is subtitled The Book of the Beast. The back of the book has Aleister E. Crowley written in Hebrew, which adds up to 666 using that method of gematria we just talked about. Let's take a peek into Sword of Song. I want to show you a part of the poem Ascension Day where Crowley talks about 666 and the cover of the book. It's a really cute poem. I won't read the whole thing to you, just this one part. It's definitely worth it. Yet by and by I hope to weave a song of anti-Christmas Eve. And first and second Beaster Day, there's one who loves me dearly, Veray, who yet believes me sprung from Tophet, either the beast or the false prophet. And by all sorts of monkey tricks, adds up my name to 666. Retire good gallop in such strife her. Superior skills makes you a cipher. Ho, I adopt the number. Look at the quaint wrapper of this book. I will deserve it if I can. It is the number of a man. As he says in Sword of Song, Crowley identifies with the beast 666. Where does that come from for him? And what does that mean to him? This label of the beast 666 comes right out of his childhood. His parents were fundamentalist Christian Plymouth Brethren. His mother, undoubtedly inspired by the Bible revelation, called Crowley the beast 666. Of course, Crowley rejected his fundamentalist Christian upbringing, but embraced the nickname. For him, the beast 666 has a solar meaning. Given Crowley's background in the magical order, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, it makes sense that he viewed it this way. The Golden Dawn, drawing from many of these old grimoires, also ascribes six to Tiferet on the Tree of Life, which is associated with the sun. Here are two news articles covering a rather famous trial Crowley was involved in. The one on the left is an article from the Yorkshire Post, April 11th, 1934. This article talks about how Crowley views himself as Little Sunshine. In the Daily Telegraph on the right, Crowley was quoted saying, The Beast 666 only means sunlight. You can call me Little Sunshine. I just think it's so funny. Crowley said, call me Little Sunshine. What a great nickname. This is another example of Crowley connecting the Beast 666 with a solar number, which is what that meant to him. This has been my presentation all about the number 666. I really appreciate you for watching and joining me today. I hope you have found it informative and helpful. You may want to go check out my other videos exploring what exactly is magic and thelema and all of these other esoteric and occult subjects. So as always, thank you for joining and I am the center of expression for the primal will to good and so are you.